This is one of two follow-up videos to a video that I just published on my main channel about electricity waves. So this is gonna make a lot more sense if you watch that first. But to recap, I'm sending pulses of electricity down this homemade cable and taking lots of measurements so we can see the actual propagation of the wave down the line. The animation you've been watching is what happens when the ends of the wire are connected so current can flow around the loop. But this is what happens when the wires are disconnected. The wave still propagates, but now the voltage bounces up when it reflects. You'll also notice that all the electrons stop moving in this case because the wires are actually disconnected at the end, so they can't continue. In both cases, the initial pulse constitutes a wave of voltage that's about two and a quarter volts tall, and in this part of the wire, but not yet in this part of the wire, about 15 milliamps is flowing. The important thing is that this wave always bounces back. The power supply at this end of the circuit has no idea how much current should flow in this wire when you flip the switch because it doesn't know what's at the other end. It could be an open circuit, it could be a dead short, or it could be anything in between. When we watch this signal bounce back and forth, we're actually watching the circuit figure out how much current should flow and adjusting itself until it reaches equilibrium. Earlier I said that this wave is about two and a quarter volts tall and about 15 milliamps of current. If you rearrange Ohm's law from V equals IR to V divided by I equals R, we can calculate that this voltage and current correspond to a resistance of about 150 ohms. But that's really weird because there isn't a 150 ohm resistor anywhere in this circuit. But at the same time, that's sort of what this wave is like expecting to see, to anthropomorphize a little bit. When this wave that's sort of expecting 150 ohms zigzags its way all the way down this cable to the end and it realizes that I've just soldered the wires together and there's a less than one ohm resistor terminating this cable, it realizes it's made a mistake. It's now applying two and a quarter volts across a much smaller resistance, which means that the current has to go up. All the electrons actually accelerate again as the wave reaches the end of the wire. I'll replay this a few times so that we can look at different parts of the animation. If you look at the electron dots, you can see the electrons at the end of the wire clump up and start moving. And then as the wave passes back by them in the other direction, they accelerate a second time and spread out. Every time this wave passes by the same electron, every time that electron is exposed to this really steep voltage slope, it speeds up just a tiny little bit. And if the wave is traveling in the same direction as the electrons, the net result of this is that they get clumped up when they accelerate. But if the wave is moving in the opposite direction as the electrons, the net result is that they spread out when they accelerate. This happens until all the electrons are moving and the step has died out. At that point, after the transient is gone, the circuit will be obeying Ohm's law. Now let's look at the speed graph at the bottom because I think that makes this much clearer. As the wave goes by, we see all the electrons in the wire get accelerated to about the same speed. And then when the wave travels in the other direction, they all get a bit faster. Every time this wave goes back and forth, it makes the electrons a tiny bit faster. It increases the current in the wire until Ohm's law is satisfied. At that point, when all the electrons in the wire stop accelerating, and they're all just on average moving with their drift velocity that they want to, when the circuit is in steady state, that's when the DC version of Ohm's law is fulfilled. And all of this makes sense with like the water model that I was discussing in the last video. Now I've used the word impedance a couple times in this video already, and I wanna to try to explain that. I had heard the phrase impedance matching before, and I knew what it meant in a DC context when you're trying to match like a, a resistive load with a power supply. But in the context of AC and like, waves traveling down cables, which is how you normally hear about it in an electrical engineering sense, I really didn't appreciate it. I didn't appreciate how magical it was until building this exact setup here on this table and watching waves bounce through this cable and reflect off of varying loads at the end of this line. So hopefully, after I explain this, you're also going to think it's magical. So this is an impedance matched circuit. Again, the exact same pulse leaves from the switch, about 15 milliamps of current and a voltage step of about two and a quarter volts. But when this signal gets to the end of the line, it just stops. Like there's hardly any ripple, it just stays there. Based on what we've seen, this doesn't make any sense. It always sort of bounces around a little bit. How did it possibly just stop? 
That happened because I gave the electrons exactly what they expected to see. I put a 150 ohm resistor at the end of the line. This concept took me a lot longer to absorb than I would have liked. When electrical engineers talk about line impedance or transmission line impedance, they're normally talking about this value, this magical resistor that you can use to stop all reflections, which is, to be fair, the practical application. So it makes sense that this is how they talk about it. But from a slightly more physics-y perspective, I didn't understand why such a magic value could exist. It seems like there should always be reflections until I started playing with this circuit and I put a bunch of different resistors at the end and realized that every single time, sort of, of course, the initial pulse has to look the same because the power supply doesn't know what's at the end yet. Here's a sampling of a lot of different resistances at the end of the wire. And when these waves start, they all look the same. They have to look the same because the source doesn't have time to know what the load looks like. Causality prevents it. So we have these identical waves traveling down their cables and then they all hit different loads. Can you spot the impedance matched circuit with the 150 ohm resistor? It's that one. And this one dropping to zero is the zero ohm short and this totally flat one up top is the infinity ohm disconnected wire. The other way that line impedance is described is as a substitute resistor, an imaginary construction that allows you to use Ohm's law even when things shouldn't be that simple. Electrical engineers really like Ohm's law. Basically, when we construct a circuit like this, we have a voltage source, we have a resistance associated with the voltage source that we can't get rid of, and then we have our long cable and our load at the end. The actual resistance of these wires is very small, in most cables less than an ohm compared to 44 ohms in the power supply at this case and some number of ohms between zero and infinity that I've put at the load. The instant we flick this switch, some amount of current has to flow towards the load. And that initial current can be estimated if you remove this long transmission line and replace it with a single 150 ohm resistor. Earlier I said that in this pulse down the line, we had 2.25 volts of potential and 15 milliamps of current. That's the current and voltage we would expect to see across a 150 ohm resistor in this simpler hypothetical circuit. Normally, and for good reason, engineers like to handle impedance matched circuits. So the explanation normally ends here. The current sees what looks like a 150 ohm resistor for the first few nanoseconds. And eventually the signal reaches the end of the line through wires with negligible resistance. The signal sees the actual 150 ohm resistor and then the total resistance that's actually connected is still 150 ohms, so nothing changes. You just sort of finished turning on the circuit. It feels like magic that everything can turn on so fast. It feels like it should break causality that a circuit can supply the correct amount of current to a load that is so far away without reflecting back and forth and having that negotiation. But in a way, they did communicate. In fact, they communicated extremely slowly and they communicated long before the switch actually turned on the circuit by way of the human that wired the whole thing and tuned this circuit so that all of these impedances lined up. This sort of situation can only exist in a circuit that's pre-tuned where you know what the light impedance is going to be. You know what that magical replacement resistor value is and you just duplicate that at the end. It doesn't break causality, it's just really carefully constructed. Which brings up a really great question of why 150 ohms? Like what about this circuit is 150 ohms? You may have come across cables that are measured in ohms and until recently, this really bugged me because I did not understand it. This is coax. Coax is a really common type of cable where you've got this conductive sheath and then you've got a conductor running down the center. The listing where I bought this sold this as 50 ohm coax. But if we like take a multimeter set to measure resistance and we go from one end and we go from one end to the other, we're looking at 0.4 ohms. Like that's not 50 ohms. And if we take the core, not the sheath, it's also about 0.4 ohms. In fact, that's so close I want to check the probes. 0.1. Yeah, so the core and the sheath of this cable are both in the range of 0.3 ohms when you measure them in DC, but it's sold as 50 ohm cable. If you take my homemade twisted pair and you measure from one end to the other, you get about 11 ohms, which is not 150 ohms. 
even the 22 ohms for a round trip and you go 11 ohms there and 11 ohms back when the end is shorted together isn't 150 ohms. But that also doesn't seem right because that's not, you don't even connect it end to end in the circuit. When we talk about replacing this line, I'm talking about cutting this wire right here coming out of the power supply and putting 150 ohm resistor in instead of this whole circuit. So if you think about it, it looks like we have 150 ohm resistor where two things aren't even connected. Now let's expose this other wire in the animation and attach it to the circuit diagram. When we throw the switch to expose the wire to the high voltage of the battery's positive terminal, we actually begin pulling electrons out of this wire. Now that this area is depleted of electrons, imagine the force on the next electron in the wire. It's being repelled by the electrons on both sides. But if we remove a few electrons on this side, these forces are no longer in balance and it gets pulled to the left. Now because these wires are close together, imagine the force on an electron in this wire. It experiences forces from electrons on both sides, but it also experiences forces from the electrons in the other wire. Once we've pulled enough electrons out of the top wire, electrons in the bottom wire experience forces bringing electrons into this area. But since the far end of the wire doesn't know this yet, we end up pulling electrons up from near the end of the cable. If we cover this up, if we sort of treat the transmission line as a black box, we see that we're pulling electrons from this wire and electrons start moving into this wire. It looks like they're connected. It looks like there's an electric current flowing through this gap, but there's not. We're just piling up charge on both sides and storing a bunch of energy in the electric field between the wires. And if you do the math, it looks like they're connected by a 150 ohm resistor. That's why we can make this substitution. This state where the wires look like they're connected, but only sort of, can only exist briefly because once we've packed as many electrons as we can into one wire and depleted as many electrons from the other wire as we can, this process stops. And at that point, the electrons have to flow through the entire loop. They have to go through this load. Or if the load is infinity, if the wires are disconnected, the electrons just stop moving. So the 150 ohm resistor is just a placeholder. It's a way to take this extremely complicated process where you're having forces on electrons that are in other wires and simplify it into a single number that can be easily used to design circuits. I really think it's a beautiful solution and it depends on electrons being able to push on each other over long distances. Every electron comes with some electric charge and every electric charge comes with a long range electric field. The electron and the electrostatic field are inseparable. The practical upshot of this is that if you need to move one electron, it can use its field to push on another electron quite a ways away. Do they need to be in the same wire? Absolutely not. But remember that every time wires aren't actually connected, every time that electric current can't keep doing what it's doing without electrons piling up somewhere, you're looking at a transient, an effect that will quickly die out and be replaced by something that's unchanging, something that requires wires to be plugged in. So now let's go back to the Y-shaped circuit and hopefully you'll see all these effects present in a much more complicated model. Now we understand this first bit. When we flip the switch, we see a pulse of voltage travel down the wire. The magnitude of this pulse is consistent with a 150 ohm resistor in this particular case where I have twisted pair made from 30 gauge wire. But really it could be anything depending on how you've made your cable and how many electrons you need to add to that cable to change its voltage. Once this pulse reaches the split, it's seen an extra 22 ohms of real resistance, the wire's actual resistance. So in total, with the power supply, we have 66 ohms of real resistance. Then we have two cables, each acting as a transmission line with an impedance of 150 ohms, and they're in parallel. So if we substitute both of those for 150 ohm resistors, we can calculate with this like fudged approximate ohms law that the pulses traveling down each fork in the wire will be about 70% as tall as the pulse in the first wire. When I started on this, I was fully expecting the pulses after the fork to be half as tall because you take one pulse and then you split it into two. But I was missing the fact that the power supply and the wires have resistances and those shift the results slightly. I also wasn't thinking about the reflection. At the same time we send pulses down both far legs of the circuit, the original pulse got to the end of the first leg. When it hits this Y, it suddenly sees a resistor that's too small. It sees a 75 ohm resistor being half of 150. 
and that started a reflection in the other direction, back towards the power supply. While our primary wave travels down the fork legs, the electrons in the first leg are seeing another wave and actually still speeding up. This is beyond counterintuitive the first time that you see it. And that's why electrical engineers came up with this like substitute in a fake resistor construction because it lets us calculate what's happening very easily, relatively easily. It still requires a lot of care. When the pulses get to their respective loads of zero for the shorted out cable and infinity for the disconnected cable, they reflect back. These electrons stop dead in their tracks and these electrons speed up. This is a dramatically more complicated example than a single wire ending in a single resistor, but you can analyze any little piece of this circuit using all the same rules. Another fun one is to repeat this experiment with resistive wire. This is a separate setup I made using nichrome wire over half the circuit. When this one bounces back, it ends up finding a stable voltage much faster because the whole wire is sort of acting as a load. If you're still watching at this point, I hope you found this process as cool as I did. When I decided to cut the discussion of impedance matching from the main video, I knew that I would have to leave it somewhere else. And hopefully, after looking at these plots, some of you have had the same epiphany that I did. The impedance of the line governs the strength of the initial pulse of current, which is the same no matter what. And then every subsequent reflection of that wave works to bring the circuit towards equilibrium. If the initial pulse was too strong, on the reflection, the electrons slow down. And if the initial pulse was too weak, then on the reflection, the electrons speed up. I think it's a beautiful example of a stable equilibrium in physics. And I hope that this method of recording very many oscilloscope traces to observe the waves has made this process clearer. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.